Hello there, my name is Brandon and welcome to part two of our three-part series focused on making a pixel art scene in Clip Studio Paint. In the previous video, we started this side-scroller mock-up by making a character, a few overlay elements, and an initial framework for the setting. In this video, we're going to finish the line work for the environment and then add some shading to give it some dimension. So let's get to it. My typical flow for line work is to use the dot pen to draw the shapes and lines that I need, but I also flip over to the eraser either to erase details into an object or to make subtle corrections on the outside of it if needed. The Mila pen is also quite handy because it lets you adjust the brush size and settings, so it works well for dotting in larger clusters of pixels at once. I use the shortcut keys to constantly flip between these tools, and I pretty much always leave one hand hovering around those keys to make the tool selections while the other hand is doing the actual drawing or erasing movements. Another great place to find efficiency in the creation of pixel art is by using repetition. A small repeatable item like a foliage design can be treated like a game asset, and if I feel it suits the look that I'm going for, I'll often copy paste an item like this to give the world that consistent styling. Working on the grid can assist with this because you can create the object to fit a perfect section of the grid and work out the repeat pattern that way. For example, in this piece I've spaced out the posts underneath the handrail at intervals of two tiles apart from one another. So using the grid becomes a quick way to maintain a tidy look for these sort of repetitive designs. If we're planning on integrating simple shapes into the line work design, one thing we can do is use the shape tool set to the line and fill option. If the fill is set to the background color, in this case being the plain gray, the shape will end up covering the design behind it, thereby providing a nice way to layer objects in front of others. If you're worried about losing what was behind it, you can carry this out on a new layer so you can always step back or just have a way to shift that object around if you like. For a static scene like this, I usually merge the layers together once I'm happy with that object's position within the setting. The shape tools are great for these kind of additions because we can choose silhouettes that get us most of the way to the objects that we're trying to add. By using the polygon subtool, for example, we can specify the number of sides we want the shape to have which is how I quickly roughed in the form for this triangular street sign. So using these sorts of techniques, I continue adding objects and details into the scene. For this particular style that relies heavily on outlines to define everything, I like to complete all the line work on its own before adding shading and color, because it gives you time to focus on ways to make everything readable just through the line construction and placement alone. If it looks good just as an outline, then by the time we add shading and color to this, it should just be that much more clear and readable in the final product. Using line work as the foundation of the piece in general is a great way to just focus on the logic used in your approach to building objects. A lot of the additions to this scene are very flat or have angular edges, so I wanted to find ways to introduce more freeform designs into here as well. And I used the Miller pen at a large brush size to draw out some custom lettering for the shop sign. Freehand items like this often start a little bit rough, but I go in close after with the one pixel eraser and dot pen to try and tidy up the edges and balance out these angles and curves while still maintaining some kind of custom feel to it. Similarly, we can also use those larger brush sizes of the Miller pen to blob out a character silhouette. In the previous video, we used a stick figure as the basis for the character, but we can also shape silhouettes roughly into a desired gesture and then erase pockets of detail to find the character design within that. This approach kind of feels more like sculpting the character in a sense, and I'd recommend trying out various approaches to sprite design like this and just try to see what feels right for your workflow. So here's a look at the finalized line work for this scene. We've got the various shapes, lines, and repetition providing most of the foundation, and then the custom detailing with the dot pen and millipen for a lot of the specific decoration here. This looks like the kind of thing you could treat as a coloring book and go straight to dropping all sorts of colors into these lines using a paint bucket. And you'd be right, but first we need to discuss a very foundational element of color selections. Whether it's obvious or not, every color has its own perceived strength of appearance. This is often referred to as the color value, and it describes how light or dark the color is and it's a concept that I find easiest to understand when viewing images in grayscale. Assessing color strength in grayscale simplifies the color information into a single number and makes it easier to compare the relative strength of colors without having to consider hue and saturation quite yet. 
In this example, we've got a palette of only four colors. There's a white, a black, and two gray tones which are evenly spaced between those extremes. This provides a balanced contrast that's allowing everything to be clear and readable. If we were to shift those two middle tones, the grays, towards the extremes, we lose a good deal of readability because now we've kind of split them into two pairs of darks and lights. So we're not really making the most of our limited palette of four to provide an easy to understand contrast. In a third example, let's move the extremes in while placing the middle tones back into balance. See how it's quite readable again, except now it's a bit of a softer look overall because the black and white are not at their extreme values. So it's a little bit easier on the eyes. When we're developing limited color palettes, we can start by selecting an appealing contrast scheme using basic grayscale values, and then we'll cast color into them later using functions within Clip Studio Paint. So for this piece, I'm going to use grayscale values at 20, 45, 65, and 85. The reason I've left a greater separation in value in the first two shades compared to the rest is because I thought it would help emphasize that line work ever so slightly within that contrast scheme. I'm using the eyedropper to select the darkest tone, and then with the fill tool active, I can simply click within a spot of the line work to fill it as that color. Because the apply to connected pixels only box was unchecked, the fill applied to all line work regardless of it being continuous or not. Similarly, I select one of the mid-tone grays and fill in all the remaining space that isn't line work. Next, I'm loading up the last two shades into the two available color slots here and using X to toggle between which one is active at the time. Now, since we'll be coloring individual sections of the artwork this time, we'll ensure that the connected pixel box is checked this time, and also ensure that the close gap option is unchecked. Otherwise, the fill tool may not detect continuous spots that narrow down to only a few pixels, and we definitely want it to pick up everything within a continuous section. From here, it's as simple as doing laps through the piece and deciding which parts are going to be lighter or darker than the mid-tone that was already placed throughout. I'm keeping light source in mind by generally using lighter tones on the left side of an object and darker tones on the right side. I enjoy working in this style because, like I mentioned earlier, I'm basically kind of treating this line work as a coloring book at this point and just placing those flat colors within those lines. But if you're looking to achieve another rendering style, maybe something that doesn't use heavy line work like this, you could use a similar workflow by building up the rendering of an object one shade at a time from a small palette of gray tones like this. In the case of the line work though, another option to color it in would be to use one of the brushes or pens. In this example, I've got the character line work on an upper layer and I'm painting in the shading underneath that. Something like this would work well if you were wanting to layer a few different colors in one pass while still keeping that line work intact. In cases where the line work itself is not continuous and thus leaves connecting space to a section you don't want filled, that gap should be closed up before making the fill. In this example, I've closed the gap using the dot pen, and now I'm using the magic wand tool to make a selection of the area, and then the alt backspace shortcut to make the fill. This is of course another alternative to achieve the fill, and it works really well for selecting multiple spots before deciding to fill them in. And you could perhaps even fill them in on a new layer if you wanted to manipulate that selection separate from the rest of the illustration. So here's a look at the result of having filled in each section with one of those grayscale tones. Compared to the line work alone, you can see that we brought a lot of dimension and interest through the use of balanced contrast and a consistent lighting scheme. And bear in mind that there's been no further layering of tones at this point. This is just filling solid sections of the line work with singular tones, what's sometimes referred to as the flats. In the next video, we're going to be colorizing this grayscale image in pretty much one step, and then we'll be doing a final round of polishing with that applied color. So thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.